Good evening. Good evening. Try again. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll try to project. I'll, thank you all for um, coming out. My name is uh, Jordan Camp, and I'm the co-editor with Christina Hedderton of Police and um, the Planet, Why the Policing Crisis Led to Black Lives Matter. Before I uh, go into that, let me just say I'm honored to speak at an event hosted by the Haven Center. I really, really uh, want to thank uh, Patrick Barrett, who's uh, sitting here, and Matthew Ryder, who's sitting here for you know all the work that you did in making this um, space happen and for the kind invitation. And really, uh, a heartfelt thanks to Alan Ruff and to WORT for uh, welcoming me here and for the really kind introduction um, this evening. Uh, I'm also uh, <coughs> delighted to see um, some colleagues whose uh, work I admire uh, who work on uh, campus here, particularly Tulani um, Davis uh, here tonight. So um, without uh, further ado, let me jump um, right into it and then I'll really look forward to the uh, Q&A. I'll, I'll speak for about 25 or, or 30 minutes and then we can have a discussion. Um, what I'd like to do uh, tonight is first give an overview of the book, uh, Policing the Planet. Describe what uh, Christina Heatherton and I are trying uh, to achieve with it and which voices we are amplifying. I mean, after all, one of the premises of the book is that we're living through uh, pro possibly the deepest crisis of legitimacy or, or authority for U.S. policing that we've seen since the Watts Uprising in 1965, the Detroit Rebellion in 1967, and the hundreds of cities that exploded uh, following the assassination of Dr. King in 1968. And one of the things that really guided us in putting together Policing the Planet was that we believe that no one as scholars or as journalists had any right really to weigh in on this crisis until we had learned to listen to the people who were in the streets. And so that really motivated us to put the volume um, together. I also try to say what frameworks and questions that we think are really critically important at this decisive uh, historical moment, and, and then we can have a discussion and even a debate uh, if, you, if you like. But before I, I say that, not that uh, this audience may need reminding, but over the last few weeks, we've seen uh, this reemergence of large-scale uh, social protest that we had seen, you know, uh, in Ferguson after the, you know, the killing of Mike Brown uh, in Staten Island in New York after the brutal assassination of Eric Garner and after uh, the death of Freddie Gray uh, in Baltimore with the killing of Keith Lamont Scott in Charlotte and Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa. And people across the country, but particularly in, in Charlotte, have engaged in direct action to show the pervasive and persistent realities of racism and of state violence uh, in the United States, such that today these place names, Charlotte, Baton Rouge, Baltimore, Ferguson, Staten Island, join the names of the cities I mentioned before, Watts and Newark, in the collective memory of unrest against police violence. Uh, we released uh, this book just nine years though since uprisings rocked Oakland uh, in response to Oscar Grant's death at the hands of subway police. And, you know, it's 2016, it's the 24th anniversary of the uprising in Los Angeles after the brutal beating of Rodney King and the officers who beat him who were acquitted. That was, of course, the largest urban uprising in U.S. history. And we are also uh, living in a moment that it's 50 years since the urban uprisings that I mentioned before, when Dr. Martin Luther King described them uh, in the following terms. He said, you know, the bombs in Vietnam exploded home. The security that we profess to seek 
in four adventures we will lose in our decaying cities. So while each of the events may seem like you know singular instances of a few you know kind of bad apple uh, cops, what we're trying uh, to argue is that these events then and now triggered by police violence were never simply reducible to police violence. Rather, the people have been organizing against the accumulating consequences of what Dr. King described as the racism, militarism, and poverty that people have been experiencing for decades. And what we're seeing on the streets are people struggling for justice, for freedom, and for life. And we put together this book in order to amplify those voices. These demonstrators have refused to let these premature deaths be explained as mere access or uh, excess rather or accident. They call attention to the underlying material conditions which has preceded and ultimately enabled these killings. And so what we want to ask is rather than, you know, how can the police kill less? We think that these events have forced a broader set of questions. Why have the police been endowed with the arbitrary capacity to regulate the lives of the racialized poor in U.S. cities? Why do they have expanding and unfettered access to the bodies of poor people in general and poor people of color routinely? How and why are poor people criminalized for occupying public space. Can the problem of police violence be solved by, you know, as uh, some people have suggested, the addition of more police? Or even, you know, better trained, more diverse, or better monitored police with, with body cameras, and so on. As many of the police and federal proposals have suggested, how have these issues been addressed in other global contexts? And finally, what alternative solutions to the policing crisis might we imagine uh, to you know, enact a better future? This book is a collaborative effort between social movement organizations, scholar activists, journalists, and artists to address these questions. We foreground the visions that have emerged from these anti-racist uh, social movements struggling against policing and for social justice. So this includes the Black Lives Matter co-founder, or one of them, uh, Patrice Cullors, Asha Rosa, Paige May, and Brianna Champion from the Chicago-based We Charge Genocide, co-founder of Homies Unidos, Alex Sanchez, Immigrants, rights activist, and photojournalist Mizue, Mizue rather, Azeki, Critical Resistance co-founder Rachel Herzing, and Pete White, and Becky Dennison from the Los Angeles Community Action Network. And as Alan uh, mentioned, we feature the work of scholars like Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Robin D.G. Kelly, George uh, Lipsitz, Naomi Murakawa, Vijay Prashad, uh, and others. And we also open the book with a historic uh, new poem uh, by the poet Martin uh, Espada, who asked, you know, I, I think brilliantly, how we could have lived or died uh, this way. Following the lead of these social movements and uh, intellectuals, we reassess this policing philosophy known as broken windows theory. How many people have heard of broken windows theory? Uh, it's also, uh, you know, been uh, rebranded in, in different ways, order maintenance, uh, policing, uh, zero tolerance, policing, and, and now we have on offer uh, community policing, uh, neighborhood policing. But we're trying to uh, understand how this, uh, praised as a comprehensive uh, model of policing, how this doctrine has vastly uh, broadened the capacities of police both nationally and globally. And we're trying to explore the rise and spread of this broken windows model of policing 
through analyzing, well, again, as Alan mentioned in the beginning, these vengeful uh, campaigns against the racialized poor, black people, native people, immigrant workers, black and Latino youth, uh, gender non-conforming people, the homeless, sex workers, and others. And in examining the spread of this model of U.S. policing that's implemented in U.S. cities and then uh, spread around the world, we're trying to explore how broken windows policing has become the political expression of neoliberal capitalism at the urban scale. Now, I could say more about that, but what we're trying uh, to suggest is that racism has sustained and naturalized these processes as if they were inevitable, inexorable, thus just and right. Therefore, the book considers the struggle against racism, militarism, and capital, which is what we mean by the policing of the planet, as a central political challenge of our time. Now, since so many of you have heard about this uh, concept, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but I will say, you know, the concept's deceivingly simple, right? The idea is to stop major crimes from occurring. First, you have to stop uh, disorder. Uh, from proliferating. What's the disorder? Graffiti, litter, panhandling, public urination, public drunkenness, uh, the sale of untaxed cigarettes, uh, and, and that was the famous case with, with Eric Garner, and so forth. It proposes that the best way to prevent major crimes is for people to take responsibility for their neighborhoods and for the police to facilitate that process. So the metaphor kind of goes it, 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 and if a window in a neighborhood stays broken, it signals neglect, and it encourages small crimes, which lead to larger crimes. And then, you know, this may seem like uh, common sense. Uh, the problem with this common sense understanding of uh, broken uh, windows is that instead of addressing individual crimes, this broken windows has given police new authorization to control and moderate individual behavior. And there's also absolutely no evidence to suggest that this aggressive policing of small time crime and disorder you know, uh, has any effect on the violent crimes at all. Uh, this has been uh, widely refuted. But what there is a general consensus about is that broken windows has constituted a fundamental expansion and redefinition of state capacities on the urban scale, both across the country and uh, worldwide. So as you know, broken windows is a kind of shorthand for what's known as order maintenance, which I mentioned before, a practice popularized by the conservative social scientist James Q. Wilson and George Kelly, and promoted widely by the think tank, the Manhattan Institute. It had been popularized by this 1982 uh, Atlantic Magazine article. And it's important to understand that this is a kind of pseudoscience. It's not a, a peer-reviewed uh, scholarly uh, work. Uh, it has no uh, empirical validity. It's been widely refuted by scholars uh, you know, across the disciplines, possibly most famously by Bernard Harcourt in his book called The Illusions of Order, which he you know, systematically destroys the kind of underlying um, theoretical ideas behind it. But uh, all that to say, they concluded uh, that, you know, uh, if, you, if you check this uh, disorder uh, aggressively, that uh, you could, uh, you know, reassert security in, in the city. And it has become a powerful metaphor and indeed dominated, I think, public policy discussions around policing. But what constitutes order and for whom seem to need no uh, explanation? Under this arrangement, police can effectively function in an array of roles. Uh, they can serve as mental health facilitators. 
school disciplinarians, public housing managers, and even guards against uh, public trespassing. And some municipalities, the police also aggressively serve as a kind of surrogate tax collectors. Or uh, how many of you read the DOJ report on, on Ferguson? Uh, you know that they concluded that they're revenue uh, generators uh, as well. And less well-studied examples such as Los Angeles, which we go into detail in the book, in this area of downtown Los Angeles, otherwise known as Skid Row, which has the highest concentration of poverty, uh, homelessness, and is over 85% uh, highest concentration in the country. Sorry. Uh, and it's over 85% black people. You have a situation where the city devotes 100 million dollars uh, towards homelessness, but 87 million dollars of that budget actually goes to the police. Lest we forget, uh, Akai Gurley was assassinated by police officers patrolling public housing projects in New York. 12-year-old Tamir Rice was killed by police charged with securing a public park. And uh, again, Eric Garner was strangled to death for uh, selling uh, Lucy's. Broken Windows policing produces such fatal encounters in which one under overfunded segment of the state dominates assaults and helps reinforce the eradication of the other. But let me say something about uh, the subtitle of the book, Why the Policing Crisis Led to Black Lives Matter. As we describe in the book, some of this broken windows policing can be traced back to uh, this figure of William Bratton. Have you heard of William Bratton before? Yeah? He, he's recently uh, stepped down as police commissioner of New York City. Yeah? Uh, did he? Uh, and he had uh, famously, uh, you know, been appointed for the second time in, in, in 2013 after uh, first being hired in uh, 1993. And after the uprisings in response to Eric Garner's uh, death, Bratton assert, assessed the situation in the following terms. He said, let's face it. We're in a crisis uh, in the US around race and policing. And he says, it's the worst or the deepest crisis that he had seen since he started policing in uh, 1970. Now, this is one of the few things that actually uh, agreed with Bratton. Uh, about. I, I think his uh, comment is uh, unwittingly uh, in, incisive, but it's also uh, an effort to restore authority for a model that he had spent over two decades uh, promoting. When he was hired in 1993 to head the New York City Police Department by then Mayor Rudolph uh, Giuliani, who you, you know, hear <laughs> Uh, you've heard about it in recent uh, months because you know he's become uh, an advisor in the Trump uh, campaign. But they hire Bratton amidst the then worst economic uh, crisis since the 1930s, and there was a major struggle in New York City around these same policing tactics that we see today in New York and Ferguson. Baltimore and Charlotte around the country. Uh, in this intervening uh, 20 years, Bratton's broken windows policing first established in New York on a large scale, though there were previous practices, you know, places like New York in the 1970s, but at the urban scale first in New York, expanded to cities like LA where he became police commissioner. But he had also served as a private uh, consultant to urban governments around the world and had been you know, exported, hence the title uh, Policing the Planet. And what we tried to argue uh, in the book is that Broken Windows took shape as a response to a series of crises in the late 20th century. That it became the dominant strategy of community policing alongside the consolidation of the U.S. as the largest carceral state 
on the planet. And after all, I mean, many of you, I think, uh, already know this, this, but it bears repeating uh, again that the U.S. you know incarcerates uh, more people than any other uh, state in the world, and they're overwhelmingly uh, you know uh, the poor, uh, people of color, and the unemployed. But it also took shape alongside the neoliberal transformation of cities uh, in this same period. So Bratton oversaw its implementation as part of his dedication, and this is his language, to reclaiming the public spaces of New York during the 1990s. And this logic, what he's trying to, who, who's he reclaiming the city from? Who's it been lost from? Uh, you know, the homeless, the poor, people of color, women, LGBTQ communities, ideas that, uh, you know, you're going you're gonna to take it back. And this informs this kind of vendetta against uh, aggrieved and uh, <coughs> uh, racialized uh, communities, whom Bratton and his allies said we have you know, zero uh, tolerance for their purported bad uh, behaviors. And its success, its purported turnaround, as Bratton and his advisors in the Manhattan Institute uh, like to tell, provided this model for cities facing similar crises of massive unemployment, of the spectacle of mass poverty, of uh, the unprecedented mass homelessness that we see uh, in cities. But what we also want to suggest is that the success of this broken windows or zero tolerance model of policing has essentially functioned as an urban strategy enabling the gentrification of cities. That it came into being at the very moment where you've seen a whole scale restructuring of urban space in the interest of real estate developers, financiers, and uh, banks, and led to a uh, mass displacement, uh, dispossession, and uh, just plain dissing of uh, poor people who had uh, lived in uh, inner city uh, areas. But most perniciously, perhaps, and I want to lay critical pressure on this particular idea, broken windows policing has been promoted as a race-neutral response to criminality. Its disproportionate deployment in poor communities of color has been uh, justified as mere statistical inevitability. inevitability. Sorry. Consider, for example, Bratton's uh, relatively recent assertion that the mass arrest of African Americans and Latinos stems from, and this is his words, intractable racial disparities in who commits, and more importantly, who suffers from crime and disorder, end quote. In turn, he reports that African Americans and Latinos are not targeted in broken windows campaigns, but rather they are subject to mass arrest because they have a greater propensity for crime, <coughs> just as they are the greater victims. Okay. I see you shaking your head. No, it's, it's correct. Incorrect <laughs> proposition. Uh, what we want to argue is that, uh, however, it's important because broad consent to this unprecedented uh, expansion of policing and buildup of the world's largest carceral apparatus has been won precisely through such a circular racial logic. We have to understand how race is the site where consent to these coercive uh, resolutions of crisis gets won. Just as mass incarceration in America depends on a kind of suturing of racial categories to criminality, so too has broken windows conflated a kind of spatialized uh, disorder with the presence of the racialized poor. By doing so, racism eludes discussion of policing at the same moment that it animates its practice. And I should say, 
that we are, in fact, very precise in how we understand racism. Uh, we follow the lead, who's one of our contributors, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who defines racism uh, in the following terms, as the production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerabil vulnerabilities to premature death. And it's this uh, conceptualization of uh, racism that we're saying has been eluded in contemporary discussions of policing at the same moment that it animates uh, its practice. So the essays that we have here uh, from scholars, from activists, from journalists, and the interviews gathered suggest how we might confront this public policy of broken windows policing, but also, and I think this is critical, and I hope that we can uh, talk about this in the Q&A, how to overcome the racist common sense that underpins uh, the policy uh, and develop an alternative uh, common sense, an alternative uh, vision of the future and an alternative political project capable of uh, overturning uh, broken windows policing and uh, the carceral state. In this way, uh, again, as Alan suggested, it is conceived as an intervention in this moment of massive social protest, uh, political uh, crisis, and neoliberal restructuring. We want to also situate these protests that uh, I mentioned in the beginning in a global context because I think that when we sometimes see uh, you know, Black Lives Matter campaigns uh, in U.S. cities, we don't always think about how it links to a global struggle against policing that we've seen in Johannesburg uh, in the early 2000s or in Paris in 2005 and the uprisings there against police uh, violence, to Athens in 2008, or Tunisia in 2010, or indeed across North Africa uh, and the Middle East during the so-called Arab Spring during uh, 2011, and uh, of course the unrest that rocked uh, cities across the UK in 2011 after the police killing of uh, Mark Duggan. Indeed, I think we are living in a global uh, crisis of policing. We want to try to demonstrate how these social protests can help us undo this uh, expansion of policing and prisons and explore how the demand to abolish broken windows policing, not reform it, might contribute to these popular democratic struggles uh, against neoliberalism around the world. By way, something of a conclusion, and, and so that we can have uh, plenty of time for discussion, I want to go back to this poem that I said opens the book uh, by Martin Espada, which, um, if, if people read Espada's work before? One person, two people, three people, okay, good. Well, I, I hope you'll, I encourage you to take a look at it in the book. He's a, he's a major uh, poet, and this new poem depicts scenes from the history of police violence against African Americans, against Native Americans, against uh, Puerto Ricans, and in it he powerfully begins by, and I'm quoting him now, <coughs> saying, I see the dark-skinned bodies falling in the street as their ancestors fell before the whip and steel, the last blood pooling, the last breath spitting, end quote. It's a poetic protest against the killings, most immediately of uh, Eric Garner, of Mike Brown, of uh, Walter Scott, but also it goes back in times to think about the killing of people like John, the Native American John T. Williams, or uh, 40 years ago uh, in New York with Martin Tito Perez. And uh, Espada goes into some detail about the inspirations, the uh, evidentiary basis for his poem in an interview we do with him on poetry and the political imagination. And he says, you know, that 
uh, the current policing crisis should make us ask, and I'm quoting again, how the descendants of slaves still fled and the descendants of slave catchers still shot them, end quote. And this way, I think that Espada's poetic critique of state violence reminds us of the need to, as the critical theorist Walter Benjamin put it, seize hold of a memory as it flashes up in this moment of danger that we're living in now. To be sure, his poetry demonstrates the need to kind of blast open this continuum of police violence in US history and to engage, I think, in a struggle for the oppressed past to imagine a different future. Because as Benjamin famously put it, even the dead will not be safe if our enemies win. And this enemy has not yet ceased to be victorious. As Expada explains again, we no longer have the lynch mobs. We no longer have the slave catchers. We no longer have the slave patrols, all of which use violence and terror to repress the African-American population. But some of these elements are re-emerging through policing, through police violence and state uh, terror uh, in the present. So the poem in this way, I think, and the reason I, I, I go into some detail about it, is it depicts the power of the political uh, imagination, particularly this abolitionist uh, uh, imagination. Because what I think he teaches is, is as the spider puts it, no change for the good ever comes uh, without being imagined first, even if that change seems hopeless or impossible uh, in the present. He says, after all, there was a time when the eradication of lynching was considered utopian. And we take this point about visioning to be a central intervention in the book, uh, Policing the Planet. And we believe that this struggle against broken windows, zero tolerance, community, uh, neighborhood, uh, policing, you know, my co-editor would say even they call it sweet tea policing and so on at key moments, uh, can uh, provide a basis for uh, building solidarity. And it provides the opportunity for developing demands that don't accept the logics of policing prisons and the permanent warfare uh, state that we live in. As Vijay Prashad concludes in the closing chapter, I think aptly named, uh, This Ends Badly. Uh, the task, we think, is to develop an alternative to racism and to the uh, policing and carceral state, including uh, universal access, economic power, and uh, what he calls a social wage, or the, you know, the right to public education, the right to health care. I, I, I can imagine that this is felt particularly acutely in a place like uh, Scott Walker's Wisconsin when there's been so many budget cuts. So the idea is that by demanding uh, this social wage as uh, a solution to the policing crisis, we can have a, a different kind of a future. Uh, or, uh, as he concludes, uh, we think the common sense uh, of our times uh, will lead uh, to a bad end. So thank you very much. And I think we've got plenty of time uh, for uh, you know uh, questions and answers. Uh, please. Thank you.
for organizing, organizing a demonstration. Um, comparing the Korean case to the American case, I think in Korea these uh, anti-state kind of actors are directly involved in the economic uh, processes. So these are unions, farmers who don't like the capitalist, <coughs> the capitalist state. And this is a direct, um, I guess, reaction to some of those forces. But in America, I feel like the, this whole crisis is more indirect. It's not that people are asking for higher wages or for rice prices. Um, and also in Korea, there's this whole cronyism in effect. Well, in the US, it doesn't seem like it's more of a systematic method of policing than them like, using you know, illegal force, maybe in some cases. So I, I was just wondering what your thoughts were on the whole indirectness and the systematic nature of, of US policing and what some of, like having that in mind, what some of the solutions are. Sure. I mean, if I understand the question correctly, it's about the indirect character of the of the social protest, and that you know it, it may be I, I'm arguing a struggle against neoliberalism, but it doesn't necessarily go after you know declining uh, real wages, the attack on right. Right. Although um, I, I guess uh, I, I understand what you mean, but. I actually think, have you seen this uh, movement for Black Lives Platform? How many people have heard, heard about this? Uh, okay, so, uh, you know, I was just, uh, Janae Bonsu, who's public policy uh, co-director for this group called Black Youth Project 100, which has chapters all around the country, but its epicenter is actually in Chicago. And one of the things that they've been doing for about a year is they brought together, I believe it was 30 different organizations from uh, across the country to develop a program, a platform, to lay out these systematic, I think, uh, direct demands linking racial to economic justice. And they actually have, if you go to their website, these really detailed policy proposals, I mean, around, what, around uh, workers, how to improve their conditions, and, you know, trying to think about how this struggle against, you know, Police, police violence against mass incarceration, against state violence, is actually linked to uh, a struggle for economic justice in this direct way. Because after all, as they put it, you know, even if you stop tomorrow, you know, the police uh, killing of so many uh, people of color, you'd still have an unemployment crisis. You'd still have uh, low wages. And so they're trying to think about how uh, organizers can respond to this moment through a, a transformation of the political economy as a whole. And I think uh, that this is a very exciting development that all of us, even if not involved directly in a Black Lives Matter organization, should be attending to because it has implications. If you improve, I think, the conditions, particularly of the black poor or the racialized poor in US cities, I think that that will have a, a, a spark for changing the conditions of work class uh, people color in general. So I don't know if that answered all of your question, but you know, I do think that there's a direct uh, questioning around wages, around economic justice. It's coming out of the, the movement that, that we should really be studying and, and paying attention to. Uh, please. Yeah, one of the things that interests me is the structures that kind of uh, keep the stuff in place. And I'm wondering what your views are, for example, on police unions. Um, I note that uh, the Fraternal Order of Police, which I guess is one of the biggest ones, has endorsed Donald Trump for, uh, for president. Um, I'm also told that uh, uh, many city governments are somewhat reluctant to challenge the authority of, of the police as reflected through these organized I guess trade union groups or whatever they have. Uh, but that's one aspect. And the other is um, the view that uh, is part of this is really about prosecutors. Um, and, um, you know, 
the argument being that prosecutors are really more powerful than judges in many, in many respects. So I was just wondering, you know, what your views were on um, you know, the role of police unions, um, and the role of, that prosecutors play in the sort of broader justice uh, scenario. Yeah, thanks. And are you Brenda uh, Gail yeah. Palmer? Professor Palmer, I'm a big fan of your work. I'm just really excited <laughs> to see you here. Um, and I feel like I should be uh, asking you know you these questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm only a little on the spot, uh, but it's a great question. I mean, you know, and uh, a timely one given this question of, around uh, uh, Trump. I mean, you know, it, it was amazing. Uh, that may be the only truth that he got in the uh, debate the other night was that the Fraternal Order of Police endorsed him. He <laughs> 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 got you know, one, you know, the fact checkers didn't miss. Uh, and they do have uh, in incredible uh, power in, in these cities. I mean, we've seen it with, you know, even the most modest. I mean, Bill de Blasio, who was, you know, mayor of uh, New York City, a kind of populist uh, liberal uh, who hired Bill Bratton, you know, considered uh, the U.S.'s, you know, top cop, and you would think this would make uh, the police unions happy, but, you know, he came out with even the kind of mildest uh, criticisms around racism and, and policing, and we saw the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, you know, engage in kind of a strike uh, in New York, if you remember, was it like 18 months ago, where they, they actually refused to do any, uh, any work in New York, which is really interesting because kind of uh, despite their cli claims that they keep crime rates down and so on, kind of nothing happened in New York. It didn't go uh, chaotic or crazy, and you kind of, you know, I was in the city then, you kind of wish that they would uh, go and strike more often and be hassled and so on. Uh, but also, you know, as a follow-up to this question about the fraternal order of police, Black Lives Matter, and particularly BYP 100, have been focusing on, you know, their role recently. Uh, you know, was it Corin Gaines who was murdered in Baltimore? She had a, you know, a, a, a it was a late parking ticket, and they, they show up to her house with a young uh, child, and actually, uh, you know, it end up shooting her and he's wounding uh, the child and the fraternal order of police come out in, in defense uh, of those cops and I think that you know all across uh, the country we have a, a discussion you know recently the the DOJ has uh, come out against kind of private policing of private prisons and people have been very excited by that but there's been less attention to these public unions and how much of a kind of lobbying role that they have in terms of, I think the big measure of it, or the, the way that I would understand it, is in getting these huge portions of social budgets. So in a time when there is incredible austerity in cities and states, and they seem to have no money for higher education, no money uh, for uh, roads, or they kind of, you know, uh, or, you know, any other public services, I mean, you know, places like LA, they just cut, you know, tens of thousands of hours of bus services, you can't get anywhere. They do have money for these police budgets. And if you look, I mean, the most recent uh, that I, I was coming across, in, in a city like Baltimore, for example, another place that the DOJ has focused on, in 1991, I think the uh, budgets for police was about 141 million. But by 2014, it was $450 million. And I think this has to do with this aggressive role of the uh, fraternal order of police and police unions in terms of getting a bigger uh, access of the, of, of the pie. Um, at the same time, of course, there, you know, uh, I think we need to understand, I mean, take the neighborhood just while I'm on Baltimore for a second where uh, Freddie Gray uh, lived before he was murdered. You know, Sandtown, Winchester, one of the poorest uh, neighborhoods in Maryland. It had about a 20% unemployment rate, about a 30% poverty rate. One in four people had been arrested by the police. And yet, 
Maryland spends $17 million annually to lock up people from that neighborhood, right? And that's in public dollars, you know? <coughs> Uh, and, and one of the poorest places uh, in the country. Um, what can I say about the prosecutors? I mean, I, I think it's a very suggestive comment uh, in terms of something that we should look at. The, the book doesn't, I think, spend a lot of detail uh, going into that. But, I mean, my, my basic uh, understanding of that is that there's these rewards for uh, how aggressively you can uh, give out tickets, right? get warrants, and, and send people to jail. And, you know, uh, they've been unconscionable in pursuing, you know, uh, long uh, sentences. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's something that, that scholars uh, should take up. But um, it's, it's not something that, that, you know, we've done in Police and the Planet, but I appreciate the comment and the, the push to consider it uh, more fully. I hope I answered some of the questions, so thank you. Uh, in the back, uh, here, then here. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I want to ask, uh, from a more cynical angle, uh, I hope that you know what I'm going to suggest is completely wrong in your comments. But, um, but one of my concerns, so, so at, at the, at, with, uh, after Mike Brown, after Eric Garner, uh, in my particular social circle, uh, which is sort of the conscious hip hop uh, community, um, our take on it when, when, when people around the country and people in our social media feeds were saying, well, look, this is something new, and look at how the police are killing black people, our sort of line was, was there's nothing new about this. Uh, Ice Cube in 1993 had a song called Who Got the Camera? Um, suggesting that if only there was a camera around every time an event like this happened, you know, people would be up in arms and we would have this social movement. Of course, he was making reference to Rodney King, suggesting that this is routine, this is not, you know, a, a one-off thing. Um, but the concern now, so you're talking about this, uh, this crisis and we're at, we're, we're at this moment of peak crisis, which we haven't been at since the 60s. Um, but I want to ask, what is new? Uh, so part of the question is, what is new? And then I also want to make a claim about what is at stake. Um, because with all, so, so the question now is, are there, I'm not even so sure. So that was our line, like after the first, after the second, after the third, it was like, well, this has been happening all the time, now we're just seeing it on camera. And literally, yesterday, my partner said to me, with another guest, um, of, a, of a disabled uh, black man um, killed. It, she said to me, it's almost like they're doing it on purpose. And, uh, and I, I'm not, I'm no longer comfortable saying this is just always what's been happening. Maybe it is, but, uh, but it's not clear that it is. Maybe this, maybe this is happening at a greater extent. But what is definitely new is that we have all these videos that we didn't have. That's definitely new. And as much as we are seeing these uprisings in Ferguson and on the way down, what we need to see, as everybody, in the, or certainly a critical mass of people in this room agree, we need to see massive uprisings. And if we don't, this is where I'll end my question, if we don't, um, is the danger not that the desensitization that is being accomplished with all these videos, that we are establishing a new norm whereby it is just understood as daily, regular practice that this is going to continue into perpetuity. Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, what, what I'll do, I'm going to take uh, two or three, and, the, and, then I'll, and I'll try to answer them. So I think here, and then, and then here, and then, uh, and then I'll, I'll come back to your question. So um, by the way, no disagreement with what you said about police unions, but at one point you used the phrase public unions. And this is a bad place to suggest that all public unions are engaged in the same kind of, uh, um, it's probably just a, a, a word choice thing, but. It, it, was, a, it was a slip, but, I, I'll, I'll <laughs> but I mean, but, but they, are, they are public in the sense that they're, you Yeah, know, of course, but they're, they're not right. the only public. They're not the only ones. ones. I didn't mean to suggest that at all. Um, so 
it seems to me that the platform, for example, of the movement for black just black lives, uh, but uh, uh, is really it has a whole raft of demands that have little to do with the kinds of events that led to the protests and led to the creation of the movements. So, for example, you know, on economics, it calls for the uh, restoration of the Glass-Steagall Act because I think there's some there's some argument that uh, repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act was one of the major things that led to the financial crisis. The financial crisis, in turn, supposedly had disproportionate impacts on poor people and racialized minorities. But it wasn't it, there wasn't any sort of movement uh, putting together these kinds of arguments, not on a, on a mass scale, before we saw all of these, uh, started seeing all these videos, not just posted, but sort of constantly put in front of your face by the sort of algorithmic uh, machinations of social media sites, right? So it seems to me that, as far as I could understand, your argument was that we should step back, not look at the actual micropolitics of, or microanalysis of policing situations, not even necessarily look so much at the kinds of directives that are being put forward in police departments, but step back and, and look at, I think, maybe a rise in police presence and possibly a rise in police violence as somehow connected to neoliberalism. But I never saw where exactly there was any sort of argument connecting the two. So uh, it would be very hard to claim that when the Glass-Steagall Act was actually in effect, there was less institutional racism in the United States than there is now, right? It's neoliberalism, maybe it's progressing, maybe as some people say, it's in, it's in a wave of uh, retrenchment. But if, if there is this connection, then are you making some claims about also the progression of police violence? It's really not clear to me. Thanks, and, and, and here and now. Well, on top of everything else, my, my biggest deal is accountability. Whether it's on the area of local law enforcement up to the state ranks, <coughs> we have to hold these people accountable. After all, they work for us. We pay them, and they're not doing what we want. As a society, we're, we're just being uh, goats for their armament. Because that's all they're doing. They're, they're, they're just militarizing all the police forces around the country and have done, especially after 9-11, uh, that happened. And it, it hasn't stopped. And to justify having all that equipment, we get bad things happening that shouldn't be happening mm -hmm. because there's no accountability. Mm -hmm. well, I made a judgment, judgment call because I have a badge and a gun. So I decided it's easier to kill you than to write up the report. Because otherwise I'd have all this paperwork to do and have to be accountable for everything else. But if I get rid of you, you it's no problem. Can you either ask a question or let the rest of us hear what you're saying? We can't hear you back here. So I'm just saying accountability is... Okay, thanks. Uh, so, so... Can you repeat? He asked about uh, accountability. If I, you know, if I could think about the, the question of police accountability uh, around police violence and, and killings. I think, yeah. yeah. Um, so to the first question, what's new? You know, uh, if we have, we can go back, you know, for decades, you know, century around uh, police killings, what's distinct about this moment? Is it an uptick in police violence? I mean, if you look at the statistics, I, I don't think so, right? I mean, even though we've had over 600 uh, killings uh, this year, according to The Guardian, uh, so far, you know, uh, I, I don't think that it bears out statistically that you've actually seen an increase in violence, but what you have seen, what your kind of question already alludes to, is the fact that you have seen an uptick in resistance to it. And, and I think that ha has indeed ushered in a new moment uh, in uh, how we think about policing. But, you know, we have to think about kind of action and reaction to it. You know, I think it's also motivated, uh, you know, these police departments, they feel on the defensive. Any critique that you make around these massive uh, murders, they feel 
you know, as if they're besieged. And I think it's making them act more aggressively. So we have to think about this kind of uh, dialectic. And it, it's a dangerous and explosive uh, situation, you know, not unrelated to this uh, Trump thing around, you know, he's going to make America safe again and so on. I mean, this is, this is a frightening and combustible uh, situation. Um, what else uh, is, you know, what's at stake, I think, or, or what's new about this is that, or what's at stake about this, how we read this moment, right, is that I, I don't think that, you know, this crisis, that the outcome of this crisis will be determined in advance. I think the stakes in analyzing this moment is to understand that the outcome of this policing crisis will be the product of, of a political struggle. And I think we have to be, uh, get better about analyzing the kind of source of this expansion of policing, which is why uh, we're trying to link it to neoliberalism, and not, and not just us, but our, our contributors. I mean, you know, it's not enough just to blame the police. Right? It's not just the individual police officers. We live uh, in a society that is incredibly unequal. Right? Uh, huge rates of inequality. You know, the rich have gone on tax strike. They no longer want to pay taxes at all. And I think that, you know... That makes them smart. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, the thing about a crisis, in, in that sense, then, is that uh, I think it provides an, an opportunity. Uh, one last thing, I mean, that what's new, I mean, we are living in a different moment than we saw in the 60s and the 70s in, in a few ways. I mean, I do think the presence of Obama as a black uh, president changes things about how we think about race and class and policing. The fact that you have, you know, black and Latino police officers carrying out the killings of disproportionately black and Latino uh, victims and Native American victims, if you're talking about uh, Albuquerque. I mean, this puts critical pressure uh, on us to think about how we can uh, be precise uh, in, in thinking through uh, these questions. And, uh, you know, we don't pretend to be able to, uh, you know, answer every one of these questions. But the last thing I'll say in, in terms of the stakes is we have interviews with the voices of people coming out of these social movements. So, I mean, for example, you know, if, if it's correct, if, if you agree with our assessment that this is the deepest crisis of legitimacy since the 1960s, and we also have some of the most exciting developments in terms of social movements in decades, here's an opportunity to learn to listen to these young people and to the organizers. I mean, and the kind of visions that they're uh, promoting. So I, I would really encourage people to think through, I mean, for example, you know, uh, Pete White and the Los Angeles Community Action Network in, in Los Angeles, kind of a teeny organization, but they've been fighting broken windows policing, zero tolerance policing for over a decade in downtown Los Angeles. And the thing is, they're still there. They haven't been removed, even though they're up against one of the most powerful police forces anywhere in the whole world. Uh, there's huge investments in a city like Los Angeles to build new uh, condos, lofts, restaurants, and so on, uh, amenities for gentrifiers and owners. And I think that you know they figured out a way to fight, to defend the rights of poor black people, and to figure out a way to defend public housing, you know, uh, fight for a vibrant public sector. And you know they've got lessons that could uh, I think advanced social movements uh, all around the country and world. So there's stakes in understanding, I, I think, those visions. Uh, Los Angeles Community Action Network. And there are others. I mean, yeah, the one in Chicago is, uh, was called We Charge Genocide. But there are uh, also Black Youth Project 100. And I really encourage you to do a Google search uh, and, and go to their website. Uh, so um, I, I'm not going to comment about the, you know, the the critique of the platform uh, for uh, Black Lives, or, or try to say, you know, this kind of point by point thing. But I, but I do think that um, 
we would be remiss uh, not to uh, account for just how uh, important I, I think this is in terms of, you know, particularly young black people. I mean, this, is, this group is predominantly 18 to 35, have become a political force in the United States that has to be reckoned with. And even if we don't agree with, you know, one or two of uh, their policy proposals, I think this is, uh, you know, not as important as uh, having a debate and a discussion uh, about, you know, uh, the vision that they put forth. Um, let me, I mean, let me just say my understanding of neoliberalism, uh, and maybe try to push back on the idea that there's no argument about neoliberalism and police violence. Um, I understand neoliberalism quite simply as uh, essentially a policy to promote, on one hand, privatization of the public sector, cuts in uh, social programs, right? Uh, and on the other, the expansion of budgets for policing and prisons. I think I laid that out uh, in my comments. And what uh, the basic argument that we make in the book is that to understand these uh, rampant police violence in cities around the country and the world, we need to understand it as an outcome of this transformation of the political economy, where, as I said, there's uh, increasing unemployment, poverty, and these rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods where I think the disproportionate uh, violence um, occurs. And indeed, that we do need to step back. I mean, it's a, it's a necessary uh, abstraction, I think, to understand uh, the form of the state, and I think can help, you know, focus um, our discussion. But I don't imagine that I probably, uh, you know, satisfied all of the questions. But uh, that's kind of okay with with me. Um, the accountability question. Um, I mean, I think you know, police uh, accountability isn't a uh, way in which a lot of people have tried to understand this, this crisis, right? How to make uh, the, the police uh, more uh, accountable to you know, the demands of ordinary people to live some lives with dignity and so on. And I can understand where that comes from. I wonder if it's a robust enough uh, framework for us. Um, and I, I don't mean this as a critique, no, no, no. but, but I, I'd like to have a discussion rather and see if um, you know the kind of current moment provides us with an opportunity to uh, imagine something uh, a little bit more powerful when we try to think about alternatives to the crisis that we're seeing. In other words, you know, uh, rather than uh, making police more accountable, I think maybe the question we might need to ask is. You know, how can we imagine a, a situation, particularly in cities, where they have less power to regulate people's everyday lives? How can we imagine instead, as I mentioned before, you know... Uh, but that's part of the Constitution. We have that right for that power. Mm. And to take it away is a dictatorship. Mm. You know, that's where the accountability comes in. Uh, you know, it is a bigger question. Yeah. It is. I'll take some other questions, but I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, I want. Uh, um, I think there's a connection between what he's talking about um, and what you're talking about that's an important connection to keep. I think there's a tension between a global vision and a local <coughs> vision, but it is local vision that mobilizes. And it is much easier and much more frequently the case that you can mobilize people around a neighborhood they know, a person who was shot that they know. And they can conceptualize the global, uh, that's part of a global situation. They, everybody in the groups you name knows this happens all over. But it is very important in order to empower people to do, to do uh, what needs to be done that they uh, be able to start where they are and in their communities. So to me, to have a global vision must still keep the local um, as reified and affirmed because almost every uh, big 
movement um, started with all these loci that are small, small towns, um, civil rights movement. King never knew who was going to call. He wasn't in charge of a movement across the South. People uh, took action and then called. Um, so that is what happens here in Madison. That they uh, empower themselves first. And the empowerment at the local level is way more uh, broad and, and radical in a way because it still hears local people. And national organizations don't have good ears. So mm -hmm. to me, it's really important that we think on both levels at the same time and keep that tension. And, and people keep asking, yeah, we want cops to be made accountable in our community as a step towards um, whatever the community agrees is the, the law yeah, no, this seems to be, I appreciate the, the, the comment, and uh, I mean, this seems to me absolutely right, right? I mean, once people see that they can win something uh, at a local level, it animates people in other places to see that they can win, too. And, you know, we desperately need those kind of victories uh, now. And I, and I think that's, you know, a real possibility, so I appreciate that. Um, <coughs> Were there, were there other questions or comments? Well, uh, I, I think uh, I can, you know, I, I have some books. I, I'd be happy to sign them. They're here for uh, sale. I want to thank you all for coming out.